Well, I know our official event begins at 12 p.m. So I'll just give it a couple of minutes for our attendees to roll in. And for those of you who have joined us so far, thank you so much for being punctual and uh, for your enthusiasm about today's uh, topic on planting the seeds of food rescue and the future of food rescue. Okay, so I'm seeing 12 p.m. on my clock here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some more attendees that are rolling in uh, while we get uh, things rolling here. So uh, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for our panel discussion, Planting Seeds, the Future of Food Rescue, an opportunity for us to celebrate our new building and the exciting growth of Second Harvest, the impact our organization can, continues to strive for from coast to coast, and an opportunity for us to meet with our incredible panelists who will help us answer the big question, what does the future of food rescue hold? My name is Krish, I am the manager for training and education here at Second Harvest, and I have the absolute pleasure of being your moderator for this afternoon's event. I'd first like to welcome you on behalf of Second Harvest, we are Canada's largest food rescue organization. We work with food donors from across the supply chain to recover unsold surplus food and redistribute it to nonprofit partners across the country through our fleet of trucks, third party logistics partners, and with our food rescue app. We've been rescuing food since 1985, picking up unsold restaurant meals with a hatchback. And as we've been able to grow and increase our impact, we're excited to share that we've rescued and redistributed over 41 million pounds of healthy surplus food last year alone. Again, that's 41 million pounds of good nutritious food in the last year that we've been able to prevent from going to landfill and inst instead feed communities. 2022 has marked a transformational year for Second Harvest. And while we're proud of what our new warehouse means for our impact coast to coast, I'm also excited to speak to our panel and hear their thoughts on what will come next. Before we begin, please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the Zoom features. All attendees have been muted and videos turned off upon joining. But there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen that you can use to interact with us. The chat function has also been turned off for today's session. So we do encourage you to send in any questions you may have for our panelists using the Q&A function. And the panelists will try to answer as many as possible during our Q&A period after the discussion. This session is being recorded and we will share the recording along with event highlights and other key information after the event by email and on the Second Harvest website. Before we begin, I'd like to start with a brief land acknowledgement. While we meet today on a virtual platform, 
We would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the land that we are on today, which we call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and our responsibility to improving relationships between nations and our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this nation home. Please join me in acknowledging the harms and mistakes of the past, and to consider how we can each in our own way try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you. So let's move on to some introductions. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our incredible lineup of panelists today. Our first panelist uh, requires no introduction. It is our wonderful CEO of Second Harvest, Lori Nickel. Lori Nickel is a visionary leader and champion of social and environmental justice issues related to food. She is an international thought leader on perishable food recovery with a strategic focus on increasing awareness of the negative impacts that food loss has on climate. Lori's passionate leadership has led to the development of a national food recovery network that redistributes healthy surplus food to thousands of communities experiencing hunger in Canada. Let's give a very warm welcome to Lori. Next, we have Suman Roy. Suman has had an extensive career in politics, the restaurant industry, and social services, with a focus on food insecurity and poverty alleviation. Aside from his role at Feed Scarborough, Suman is also a member of the Coalition for Healthy School Foods, the chair for the board of directors at Food Share Toronto, and was one of the key consultants who helped write the first food strategy for the city of Toronto. Feed Scarborough also participates in Second Harvest's food delivery program and our Harvest Kitchens program. Thank you so much, Suman, for joining us today. And last but not least, we have the incredible Gia Tran. Gia is a long-term volunteer at Lotus Light Charity Society, an organization that focuses on food recovery and programs to alleviate poverty in communities across Vancouver. Gia has successfully launched and continues to lead numerous initiatives, including the Lotus Light COVID-19 Community Caring Drive and the Lotus Light Food Recovery Program which distribute thousands of pounds of surplus food to communities in need across the Metro Vancouver region. In her passionate food rescue efforts, Gia uses Second Harvest's food rescue app to rescue local food donations. So we'll go ahead and get started with today's program. Lori, how exciting it is that we are both here live. Uh, I am joining from our brand new warehouse for today's event. Now, I know that Second Harvest moved operations to our new home in Etobicoke uh, in February, but could you let us know a little bit more about Second Harvest's previous facility and how our new facility compares? Well, I sure can. And first, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who is joining us today. Yay, you guys are awesome. And to our wonderful panelists and the wonderful moderator that is Krish. So uh, if you have never visited Second Harvest uh, prior to the new building, and if you've never visited the new building, we were in a very small, dingy, leased space in Northern uh, Toronto. And um, it was, we had 500 square feet of fridge and 500 square feet of freezer. And uh, small doesn't really capture the words. And it was, you know, I, I I'm so sorry. It was just, it turned into this really old dingy place, but mostly it was just way too small for the perishable food. So we went into a capital campaign in 2018. We bought a new building in Etobicoke. COVID hit, so it took us a little while to get here, but I, I invite everyone to come if you can. This is now 50,000 square foot building that we can use for perishable foods. We're primarily perishable. We have 5,000 square feet of fridge and freezer. Cubic feet is, you know, times three of that. It's enormous. It's clean. We've had, but I'm, it's clean. Of course, it should be clean, everything. But it is, everybody that comes in that works in a warehouse system said this is the cleanest, most beautiful warehouse they've ever walked in. And 
most importantly, it allows us to capture even more surplus food. It allowed us to work on a major potato project uh, when the border was closed for potatoes. And it's just changed how we can operate. So we've only started there in February, as Chris said, and already we've increased our food by 25% in the GTA. So it is really significantly different. It's beautiful. Please come and visit and I'll stop talking about it. It truly is a beautiful place and we would love to welcome you anytime that you want to join. A 25% increase in food sounds incredible and I'm sure that number is just going to keep climbing as the need for food continues to rise in Canada. On that note, Lori, what's the current landscape of food rescue in Canada? So to talk about food rescue, you really have to understand the problem that is food loss and waste. And so as many of you know, we did do some research in 2019, the avoidable crisis of food waste, where we learned that 58% of all the food produced for Canadians, including imports, is lost or wasted across the supply chain, which is uh, just so horrific as so much of that is going into landfills, creating methane gas, a direct contributor to the climate crisis, while there are more food insecure people in Canada than ever before. Like this just doesn't make sense. So once we understood that, and that was enough food, the, the avoidable piece to feed every Canadian for five months for free, every Canadian. Then we had to look at, okay, what, what is happening in food rescue? We understand food rescue, you know, we're really trying to be innovative and how do we capture more food? So we did some more research. We've, we've launched a couple of researches. One was to understand where are all the charities and how many charities are actually using food in their program? Only to discover there are 61 thousand of them. It's called Canada's Invisible Food Network. 61,000 charities and nonprofits that are supporting Canadians with food. And nobody understands that. While a great percent, well, not even a great percentage, but a percentage are food banks or in the food bank network, I think it's about 4,500. So there's this huge amount that are invisible. And so finally, we're like, okay, so now we know there's a whole bunch of food. We know that there's a whole bunch of need, which we knew, but we know where it is now. Then we did our third piece of research was wasted opportunity, where we identified where every food business is across supply chain, how many are donating surplus food, if not, why not, and discovered that only 4% of all the potential food that is available is being donated to charities and nonprofit, which is giving us a great opportunity, right? Like there's 96% that we now have a roadmap to identify and access. And so once we can do that and through the, you know, 61,000 charities that are doing amazing work on the ground, we can connect the dots with our logistics, with our app, um, and we just have to get the message out. So that's kind of what the landscape looks like across Canada to date. Thanks so much, Laurie. And it's your optimism that makes you such a good, uh, good leader. I hear only 4% of the food that's available is being donated. And my initial reaction is disappointment. But I love that you see that as an opportunity. There's that 96% that we could really be moving into communities. And we have enough food to feed Canadians for five months for free. So why not? So Gia and Suman, uh, you know, working in this space and having heard some of those numbers, what's your initial reaction? I think uh, my first is half of your reaction and half of Lori's. Uh, uh, hearing that 4% number just sinks me down, but uh, the, reality, the reality of it is we see outside and we see the, I'm focused in Scarborough. And when I see the landscape in Scarborough, our uh, Feed Scarborough started exactly a little over two years ago when in the beginning of pandemic, when we were serving 1,000 people. And now in two years, we are serving over 4,000 people every week. That is how much just in South Scarborough, our numbers have grown in the last couple of years. So four times. And there is no way uh, we are able, we would be able to support if it wasn't for food rescue. So though from 4% and 96%, I think there is a str very strong hope. And that is where I'm going towards Lori, that there is certain hope that we can rescue and divert to be able to make 
or at least help some of our community members to be slightly more food secure. That's an incredible amount of growth that you've seen in the last couple of years, Suman, and kudos to you for the incredible work that you're doing in the Scarborough community. Uh, Gia, if you have anything to add. Yeah, we, the pandemic, when the pandemic hit that, uh, you know, the real, the biggest food rescues we've ever done were through Food Rescue uh, um, app. And, um, you know, and through the help of people like Lisa, who, uh, you know, our contacts at, at, at Second Harvest, uh, you know, 20,000 pounds a week, 10,000 pounds a day, uh, you know, it was incredible. And, and I think the, the need suddenly just, you know, exploded, like maybe four times what we would normally see, families and schools, everybody suddenly saying, yeah, I need help. I, I really would like that, you know, to get those waffles. I need those sausages. I need that frozen pizza. I said, but you don't have frozen uh, like a freezer. We'll find one. <laughs> That's it's incredible how people can uh, be very resourceful when food is available that they never had access to before. And because of your incredible app, we have that now. You know, game changer. Well, we're so glad to hear it. And the resilience within communities that we've seen throughout the COVID pandemic has really, really been impressive and so, uh, so encouraging to see. So we have that 96% of food that is potential. It's an opportunity to move into communities and really feed people that need it. Uh, but Laurie, what have been some of the biggest challenges facing food rescue operations in Canada and how are these problems currently being addressed? It's a great question. So um, just for clarification, Second Harvest supports anybody. We are an opt-in service. So we support food banks. We're different in terms of we are really focused on perishable and healthy food. And while we have a fleet and warehouse in the GTA, it's to Gia's point, it's the food rescue app that supports across the country. So if you're on the app in different parts of anywhere in the country, you can access food when there's surplus food. So in remote communities, we are also working there. The app, there's not a lot, there's no surplus food where we're moving food into the north. So some of the biggest challenges are really um, the need is, is growing. Uh, we know with food inflation, it harder and harder to access the type of food that is really critical for people. And that's why we focus on healthy, perishable, Produce, dairy, and protein are the key categories that we're really trying to get out because they're the hardest to access when you're low income. And supply chain disruptions have been a challenge. So different markets have opened up also as a result of the war in, in the Ukraine. So there was um, salmon that we used to be able to access on the East Coast that we can't anymore because now it's, for, they're being, it's being sold, which great because we really want all the producers to make money. That's fine. But that is a challenge. Um, so we're managing it. And I think the best way we can manage it is there's still that opportunity. So even while there's a challenge, there's a whole lot of space there that um, where food exists and it isn't being accessed. So that's, there's not, there's not a challenge. It's all opportunity, right? It's all good. We're all good. We're going to fix it. <laughs> we love that can-do attitude. It's all about finding out, the, finding out those opportunities and how to solve those opportunities. Uh, so I think that's great kind of on a, you know, a, a more of a supply chain based scale. Uh, I would love to know a little bit more from Gia and Suman in terms of the challenges around food rescue at an organizational level. So um, I'm going to start with saying, I, and I don't know, Lori, if you remember, but I clearly remember 2020 March, and we were the handful of neighbors wanting to help other neighbors, and we put out a social media call pandemic has started, who needs help? And we had 1,000 people reach out asking for food. And I'm sitting texting Lori, Lori, I don't know what to do. There's 1,000 people looking for food. We have no idea where to start. And uh, Second Harvest, of course, jumped in and uh, supported us along with Daily Bread and uh, along with Food Share and a lot of other organizations. 
But I think uh, one of the biggest challenges that we saw in the early days, and to some extent we still see, is the logistical challenge of rescuing food. And that, for a smaller organization, it continues. I love the foodrescue.ca app, but by the time I could get and claim and figure out who's going to drive to pick it up, that food is gone. That food is claimed by somebody else. So that logistical challenge for smaller organization still remains, though it is great that everything is being claimed and it is being rescued and people are getting access to it, but it's still that, that small piece change. And uh, what we did is I eventually created a small app for Feed Scarborough, just with some local business copying the model of food rescue, just so we can actually go to our neighbors and pick it up. And that I totally, I wouldn't have been able to do it without the knowledge of what foodrescue.ca does. And it's, it's amazing. So we are trying to work through those lo logistics and figure out because we know that uh, we certainly understand as small uh, charity and nonprofit operators that without the food rescue piece, we will not be able to support our community well. There's no question about it. So it's just that how we get, get around it and work that in. Zuman, I would love to know what kind of app you guys are using <laughs> to, to address that. We're finding the same it's thing. Carbro. That's, CA. that's We just created that app. Wow. Yeah. Without food rescue, though, I mean, that's the important piece of the puzzle. Uh, yeah, we, 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 we struggle also, just like Suman, um, to share our food with groups of people because suddenly, you know, it's a, it's, it's, what are you going to do with 20,000 pounds of yogurt? But we love it. <laughs> and we found a way, but we, you know, ultimately it's, uh, it's, you know, this is available, right? And you have to act now, right? And, 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 and that where we struggle is you can't move fast enough. Uh, we're just one. And a lot of charities work in silos with that, but it's brought us together. You know, we're having conversations on Zoom. We're, you know, we're now back, to, you know, and now that everybody's got their shots and, and, and you know, can meet, we're, we're, we're talking in person again. How do we make it better with a lot of the food kitchens, the community kitchens that use the food rescue? Like they, they don't have a lot of time to access the food, but we're, we can actually just come in and, and be a hero for the day or the the month or you know when the opportunities show up so that that's that bit is still challenging <laughs> thanks so much for sharing yes that's definitely one of the things that is, is a barrier or a challenge for a lot of different agencies across canada uh, but it's one of the lovely things about community community really bands together to make things happen and it's also a challenge in the food space. It's not like any other space where, you know, something can sit on a shelf for several months before it gets sent out, right? Things need to move fast, especially that, that perishable food, that good perishable food. Uh, so I know everyone touched on this a little bit, but uh, perhaps we can recap or just uh, go into a little bit more detail about how the need for food rescue has grown over the pandemic. Um, if I, as, as I said, I'm going to recap, like our numbers have quadrupled in two years. And of course, we are a daily bread food bank agency as well. We get lots of support from daily bread, but you, this is really important, not only because the healthy aspect of it, the fresh aspect of it suddenly grows exponentially for an individual family or a person in the community with the food rescue. Uh, not only that, but it's also you are the aspect that Lori touched initially about the environmental aspect of it is you're getting those food, not creating methane gas, not going to landfill, but actually to the people who are hungry and need that. So I, I think that is another huge aspect of it. Uh, we have very recently, I think uh, earlier this year, we signed up in the kitchen program uh, with Second Harvest where we we have a commercial kitchen, we have team who knows how to cook. Now we can actually process and pass on some of the food to the smaller organizations and ready-made food, which is really important. We used to get so much 
feedback from people, especially people who do not have a fixed address, especially for seniors who might be able to get the food bank food. However, they were not able to process, cook. They have a microwave and a toaster oven in their home. I had seniors come and tell me, I don't even have the strength to open a can anymore. And what am I gonna do with this? So now with this, the second harvest program that we do with the prepared meals, the frozen meals, we are able to support that community really well. So food rescue is helping the communities tremendously. I would agree. I mean, the need is is higher all the time. So we know that food rescue is essential for communities. And, you know, we are, it's all rescue. None of this is purchased. It's all rescue food that's going to go into landfill. So on the one hand, I mean, we are a dual mission organization. We're no waste, no hunger. And so while it's helping communities, it's also helping food businesses, right? We like sustainability is really growing. ESG goals are really growing. And and businesses are starting to look very differently at their food, their food loss and waste from, um, from a sustainability place. So what we're finding is more and more businesses are coming online, which is fantastic. I think I saw something like 5,700 this morning. So it's like the balance is really great because the more it's, it's being forced by a corporation, the more support we're getting to the charities. But I, I would agree that like one of the challenges for Second Harvest and for, for our business is logistics and capacity. So to Gia's point, like we'll get a huge donation of 20, like I think we got 100 tractor trailer loads of dairy once, not once, many times, but we're like, okay, how do you move that out, right? Because we are the logistics experts. So we have to figure out a way to get that across whatever province it's in. And then there's not organizations that can really absorb that amount of food. Like not, even if it's two skids, it's just too much because they don't have the freezer or the fridge or the, like the people. So even identifying where are these other greater hubs? Like where are there more places that we can move this food into the environment? But we do, we have a list, we know where they are and we now know where the food is. So we, it's really about making those, those connections. And and trying to support them with, with, we had grants, with capacity building grants, right? So how do we make sure that they have the fridge and the people to manage the food? I think um, with Lotus Light, we went from, uh, we signed to, onto Food Rescue's app the minute it was available. I think that was June of 2019. And that became, the most exciting <laughs> start of my food rescue um, uh, experience journey. Uh, I think when I first started about 20 years ago, we, we were rescuing bakery things like 300 pounds a week. Uh, we now, I think with 4,000 pounds easily instead. And uh, you know, during the pandemic, I think um, the two years uh, in total, we've, Thanks to Food Rescue and, and, and as well as some other um, donors that we got to know through Food Rescue uh, who don't really use the app, but because they started using Food Rescue, we knew of them. I think we were able to rescue um, close to half a million pounds of food. Like shocking, right? And we're just nobody. We're just people in the downtown east side and and we're not none of us are paid we don't have a vehicle like really we just have community friends and neighbors and uh teach school teachers who say hey i need to get involved and it, it just became uh it worked itself out you know you're wondering how do we make it happen it just did and without that it would not be you know we wouldn't be as creative we wouldn't have had uh, churches, you know, distribute food in the in the church parking lots like multiple times. Like I'm talking like 10,000 pounds and gone in two hours Like these ladies, you know, it became quite something. Have a look at our, our uh, some of our photos on the gallery on the on the Lotus Lake Gallery. It was a lot of fun and it still is a lot of fun. I think one thing, Chris, I want to mention here. Uh, which is which was really very interesting. As an organization, we have our goal 
that 80% of the food we can do um, serve out will be from the food banks and the 20% we will either buy or whatever we're gonna do to uh, complement each other. But with second harvest, all the fresh goods and everything that we get, we do not need to, and we actually spend that money in creating our infrastructure better. We have two trucks right now uh, that we got. We have uh, a walk-in freezer, walk-in fridge, and we wouldn't be able to do unless and until we were able to save uh, and complement with or supplement with the second harvest uh, food rescues. So that's a very key point for operations. I'm so glad to hear that, Suman. And that's part of what we love, right? It's, it's part of taking off some of that burden in terms of food costs and the, the time and resources it takes to procure that food. We like to take that effort out of your hands. <laughs> and uh, that way you're able to, to free up things to, to improve the programs and services that you're already running. So I know we've been talking about the problem of food waste and how doom and gloom everything is, but as Laurie had said, you know, there's, there's huge opportunity here. So we know that access to healthy, nutritious food is a basic human need, and it's foundational to setting people up with, uh, for success in many different areas of life, you know, learning and brain development, physical and mental health, and so many other factors. So Lori, when it comes to food rescue in Canada, how are other social programs and services impacted by Second Harvest work? Well, I think Suma just said it the best, to be honest. Because all of our food is rescued, we don't, it's all free. Um, this allows organizations to allocate the funding, because we know it's limited for some of them, but some it's more, into the programs that they were intended for. We know food brings people together, but it if you're not a food bank specifically, you might be a senior center or a school or an after school program or a sports program or any kind of community program. They're coming for a different reason, but they'll come for the food. So last year alone, so we work with Nielsen to value our food every year based on the amount and the categories. And last year was about $120 million of food that we were able to push into the community. Well, that $120 million, and that was one year, allows organizations to use that funding for, you know, social workers or equipment or, or capacity or trucks or fridges or whatever. And I think that is what's so critical. Like, if you add that up over the next 10 years, you know, we're looking at actually getting into a billion dollars worth of food. Like, that's what we're projecting. And that's incredible. It's unfortunate. Like I am an optimist because we want to support, but it's really unfortunate that this has to exist at all. And it makes me very sad because we should be working also, and we are, poverty reduction solutions and food loss and waste solutions. So charities like ours don't have to exist at all. One day, <laughs> one day we'll be out of business, Lori. <laughs> that, that's the goal. If you're a charity, your goal needs to be to go out of business because we should not exist. There's a social or a systemic problem that we're going to all fix together. And we are. We're going to go out of business. That's the goal, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sue, man, I know that you had uh, you'd started to talk about this and kind of all the, the extra stuff that you were able to do as a result of Second Harvest uh, support. Uh, so can a sustainable food rescue system enable the operations of such programs or provide opportunity to reallocate costs? Absolutely. As I said, like we have done that over the past couple of years. Uh, we were very successful in reallocating some of the costs in our basic infrastructure, but also not only just basic infrastructure, but also in uh, programs like we have a seniors uh, program that happens once a week where the seniors come, they uh, do yoga and uh, learning and talking, but there's also a meal at the end of the day. Uh, they are able to have a meal that we do through the Second Harvest Kitchen program. And we uh, and, and that's how we grow that community. We are working on seniors' mental health. So it's not only just infrastructure, it's also about growing the programs, which is tremendously helpful because we would not have the resources. And as a lot of you know that we were uh, born two years ago, we are really small, uh, but uh, we wouldn't be able to grow if we were really spending 20% uh, 
of the food that we buy, we have actually had to pay to get those food. We wouldn't be able to because we are here growing from 1,000 people to 4,000 people. So that's a lot of money that we are actually saving with Second Harvest help to be able to invest back in the community. Invest in communities, not food. <laughs> Thanks so much for, for sharing, Suman. Uh, I, it would be great to hear as well, um, how has Feed Scarborough's partnership with Second Harvest evolved over the years? So I know that you started a couple of years ago uh, and you know we, we very quickly became great partners, uh, but how has our partnership evolved and how has Second Harvest Food Rescue model impacted that evolution? Yeah, so as I uh, briefly mentioned early, uh, earlier today that we literally had nothing like when we first started we we put some money on a table and said let's go to no frills buy some food and give it to people who need and we bought enough food for 20 families and then when we got thousand uh, people asking for food there is no way we could continue doing that so it started like that and i was like lori send me one truck come on you can do this please i need help and lori jumped in now uh, and it grew and grew and as our programs grew our relationship with Second Harvest continued to evolve. So right now we have six food bank operations, five in-person uh, food banks, and one is a virtual food bank, uh, online food bank. And uh, the only reason we could grow this because once again, we had the support of, of course, Daily Bread, but uh, the Second Harvest support was really important because that was the taking us from this level to this level when it comes to the quality of food and the freshness and uh, healthy food. So that was tremendously helpful. We were, we were lucky enough to get a federal grant to build up a kitchen. And that was tremendous because then we could work with Second Harvest in producing some of the food to give it back to Second Harvest to distribute it to smaller uh, charities and organization around Scarborough and around the East End because I know very well the first year and a half of our existence, we didn't have a kitchen, we were desperate. I asked leg uh, one of the legions for a kitchen and they allowed me, but the demand, I could not be producing 500 meals out of that tiny kitchen uh, every week. So uh, I was certainly able to, and now I think with Second Harvest, we make around 1500 meals a week uh, to send it back to the community and to uh, grow that support in the immediate community. And um, yeah, and I think this is, I, I still say, Lori, this is just the beginning. <laughs> there is a lot more to come. And it's not that I don't like working with Second Harvest as much as it's sad that the need is so high and is going higher and higher and higher that a stronger relationship here is the way to go. And we're very happy to be partnered with you, Suman. You. It's it's incredible how much we've managed to grow with it. You've managed to grow in just two years from feeding two families to running six food banks. And one of them is completely virtual. So that's incredible. And we're, we're so happy to, to be partnered with you. Um, Gia, I, I had a question for you as well in terms of a uh, Lotus Light. I know that you access rescued food through Second Harvest Food Rescue app, which works a little bit different because it's completely virtual. Uh, so by being able to rely on the app for nutritious rescued food, what does that mean for your local community? Incredible, incredible. Uh, I uh, echo what Suman said, you know, without the, the food rescue uh, fresh food, we would not have the, the, the variety and the nutrition and, and the savings, you know, we don't have to spend a dime. And, and with, through Second Harvest, we were able to access a grant that built a, a, a community kitchen uh, in the downtown east side um, to cook hot meals for the seniors and the people living in SRO. Like they're, they're homeless, but they are housed in, you know, um, temporarily until they're stabilized. And we, our meal program is, was funded by Second Harvest and it's fed by Second Harvest. So that's really, really, you know, a full circle here, right? And I don't know where else we could have that, um, you know, and giving back is, is huge, right? And then you can see the end product, like, you know, 
like zucchinis will come in and, and waffles and sausages and, and you don't know what, right? Potatoes. Oh, did I tell you about potatoes? Uh, it's just incredible. Dairy and, 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 and many, many things where we're like, okay, we're challenged by, okay, what do we do? But then we're like, okay, let's make something. And uh, we've had donors say, oh, you're mi all you're missing is the turkey. And they're suddenly, you know, inspired by this. It's like stone soup. You know that story? It's like that. And, you know, we, we went from feeding nobody a hot meal to like maybe 400 meals every week. And we're just small. We, we have three ladies and sometimes they come in and, pe and peel the vegetables, but it's, you gotta, you gotta just see it to believe it, you know? It, it makes me go, wow, right? And, and I don't even know how this ever happened without starting, like just, just, just try it, you know? And, and I didn't even come in to, to, to feed that many people, but the need is there. The need is there. You know, it, it, since the pandemic, it, it, we've seen it go up about four or five times. You know, people asking for food, families, um, the cost of groceries are just staggering. And the wages haven't kept up, right? There's food out there and I can't see it, you know, just, just continuously being thrown out like that. Right now we're dealing with 13 pallets of uh, waffles, frozen. They cost $6,000 a pallet. That's like 70 something thousand dollars, right? Of food that we, we and other organizations that we partner with don't have to spend money on. And it's good till November, right? Like, <laughs> why is it gone you know like why does it have to go in any landfill that's a, a usual pallet is like about a thousand pounds that's thirteen thousand pounds i can't even imagine it right now my house is being renovated but it would fill my where i'm sitting <laughs> up to the ceiling here right <laughs> just just a do a visual I, I want somebody to do a visual <laughs> right laurie it's just staggering Right? And, and, and we're able to, to build a huge community from this food. You know, the organizations that we, we don't speak to normally are cooperating. Um, soup kitchens such as ours, we're sharing food. Um, it's become something like a transformative device almost that's, that's causing us to come together, you know, share this food and share our ideas, you know and how to make things work. It's absolutely incredible how, how much food there is out there and all the creative ways that it gets used. Uh, and that's why a lot of our focus too is on that perishable food recovery because it's what really makes the biggest impact and allows uh, our partner organizations to, to really thrive with their communities. So it sounds like there are so many different ways to get involved with food rescue in Canada. Uh, Lori, how does Second Harvest fit into the future of food rescue in this country? And what opportunities do you see on the horizon? Oh, we don't just fit. We are charging forward, man. We are leading this charge because, I mean, there's a, there's a big environment. We're in the middle of a food crisis and a climate crisis, right? So this is we're at the intersection of environmental protection and hunger relief. So we absolutely want to capture and redistribute as much food, redirect as much food. Gia, I love it when you say you're talking to different charities because we that's what we're really, our core is collaboration, man. Like the more the merrier, take it, take it, give it away, make friends. It's only together that we're going to fix this. Um, but, you know, I sit on Canada's Food Policy Advisory Committee on the food loss and waste file to work with the minister on recommendations and one of the big ones was during COVID, we were fortunate enough to have something called the Food Rescue Surplus Program. And that's something that we are gonna to continue to advocate for because that is a triple win, right? Like, so that is the, um, us getting food, but also paying the producer. So there's an economic benefit because really our farmers are not making a lot of money. There's small margins on food, economic, environmental, and social benefits. So, I mean, I would like, every Canadian to advocate for that. And as you do that, 
I know nobody wants to hear me say this, but really the goal is to not have food loss and waste. So you set a target that says in Canada, we have set an actual target, our, our government, that we would have food loss and waste by 2030. So you have the surplus food program, and then you're, you'll watch that, that number go down. So on top of the actual, absolutely get as many partners as you can, get as many people on the app, just send as much food out as you can, we need systemic change. And we are really focused on this environmental imperative of this needs to stop. It needs to stop right at source though, right? Like this is, this is at the end of pipe when we redistribute it. And we are working on that really political piece and food banks are working on that really political piece on poverty reduction. So while we work together on policy initiatives and Suman is very involved in that, uh, to make sure that people have adequate incomes, pay them a living wage. We're also, we're working on this stop food loss and waste happening period, right? Like make sure that if it's existing, then let's get it to people. So together, we really, I'm really, I mean, it's not gonna happen tomorrow, but I really am hopeful that we can fix both of these problems, but we'll only be able to do this when we work all of us together. <laughs> Thanks so much, Laurie. There's so much opportunity out there. And I think that's why one of our core values here at Second Harvest is collaboration, because that's where the real change happens. Um, so Laurie, I know that we had mentioned this earlier that in Canada, 58% of all food produced is lost or wasted yet 32% uh, of that food is completely avoidable. Uh, so further, when food ends up in landfills, it's creating methane gas. Obviously, there's all these really harmful effects on the environment. So how does our model really fit into that bigger environmental picture? And how will the new facility support sustainable outcomes here in Canada? Well, I think just honestly, just by amplifying that food loss and waste is uh, an environmental imperative. Like that was something that people were not talking about even five or six years ago. They were not making the connection. And now we have all kinds of great research that, that really shows that if you can eliminate this, because what happens, methane is hotter than your average GHG. Canada is warming up at a much faster rate than any other country in the world. Like we really, even though we're huge and small population, it's going to impact us and we saw it right like there's a systemic problem when the fires were happening in bc and then we saw the landslides because of the floods which took out the train which the trains and the boats which caused a food supply issue and so it's all because of the climate and so once we understand how all of these things are connected then we can really mitigate this to some degree but if anybody's familiar with drawdown it's drawdown of carbon in, on the globe, their number one way of managing this is manage food loss and waste. Agriculture is one of the biggest challenges to global, like our, our climate crisis. And I, can you see, I'm really passionate about this. <laughs> My gosh. So, and as an outcome to feed people, I mean, what could be better? Rich or poor, honestly, like just let's get this food to people and away from landfill. Beautifully said. And it, it couldn't be simpler than that. <laughs> Why is this food being thrown out when it could really be used to feed everyone, really? So for the people watching at home, Laurie, what are th some things that folks can do to support the future of food rescue? Well, a few things. One is I would love it if people could read the research. So they actually just have a base understanding of this is the actual problem. There's Individual food loss and waste is also a challenge. I mean, most of the food loss and waste certainly happens further up the supply chain. But even as individuals, if we talk about it, if we look at what is happening in our own homes, and you know, Chris is fantastic. He does all of our trade and education. There's a million resources we can help you with. So if you go visit Second Harvest website, you can find all of that to reduce your own footprint. Uh, but also, you know. If you can, reach out to your government, your government official. Tell them that this matters to you. This is really important. We're in a climate crisis. We are in a, a poverty crisis. We're in a food crisis. Like these, I don't use the word crisis lightly. These, this is going to impact us. Mother Earth is not happy with us right now. And until we really get our act together, and government has a role to play, but we are government. We're the people. 
And so we drive the change. So the more people that can bug your municipal, your provincial, your federal government, and trust me, I'm gonna send all of you letters that you can take and send to them, <laughs> then the better chance we have at, at making change. And if you're a food business, get on the app, man. I promise registration is really easy. It'll take you less than five minutes and you can immediately start donating food to charities across Canada. Uh, Gia and Suman, to the folks watching at home, what message do you want to share about the importance of food rescue? So I'm, I'm not going to say gonna... what oh, Lori said. Sorry. Go ahead, Gia. Which... sorry. No, go ahead, Gia. I'm going to just say that what Lori said is like, why is this being thrown out is, is the reaction I get from the people that are helping us, um, you know, pick up the food and, 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 you know, from the warehouses that they're like, why is this being thrown out? It's so good. You know, the, the, the you know, shepherd's pies, you know, uh, why hot dogs, why hamburgers, <laughs> cheese, every little thing that you get, pineapples, like 2000 pounds of pine and they're perfect beautiful and not even ready to eat yet you know that's that's the comment for the feedback that we get and it i encourage everybody that i come across with you know to just have a look at the app and and try to be you know, if they want to make a difference other than donating <laughs> to all the charities you know have a look at what this is doing and 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 it gives me great joy to know that we're able to sign up like one little grocery store because it made a huge difference to their food waste. Not only that, but it, it this one little grocery store is able to give back continuously without, you know, just throwing it in the bin in the back. Just one. I'm sure it's a huge win for them but i haven't heard back but i i would love to circle back and say hey what happened you know you used to throw out like 200 pounds of tomatoes and, and bananas all the time and now they're just like hmm. we got a lot of space now you know it's magic That's awesome. For uh, me, I think my bane of existence is the word best before and expiry. And that just drives me crazy. Um, it's so I think that is got to, and uh, for anybody sitting at home and hearing, listening to this, please take your two minutes to understand what is best before versus what is expiry. And 99% of the stuff that you see in the grocery stores are best before and they are not expired. So I think there is a, that is one big issue. But the other thing on a positive note that I wanna share, and this was initially when we started, we realized that logistics be, was a huge challenge for us to uh, repurpose food and distribute food. So we created Feed Scarborough ambassadors throughout the community. And in every community, we encouraged one ambassador to start a food rescue Facebook group. So that really took off like amazingly because then anybody who had even uh, two portions of extra rice could quickly go and put up, hey, somebody needs rice. This is my address, come and pick it up. And somebody would go and pick it up. So that way we didn't get involved, but we really encouraged uh, the community to stand up for the community to rescue food, which took off really well. And it still, still continues. And I'm so proud to see how our uh, communities in South Scarborough has really embraced it. That is a win, Suman. That's such a wonderful, innovative idea. And just circling back to what Suman had said earlier about best before date labels, if anyone is interested in learning more about best before date labels, we have a couple of great resources on our website, uh, secondharvest.ca. We have an e-module on uh, a a guide to food date labels, which only takes 10 minutes. We also have our wonderful best before timetable, which tells you about different uh, types of food categories and how far past the best before date you may actually be able to still consume them. And if I can just add, there are only five foods in Canada that expire. Two are by prescription. You'll never ever get them unless your doctor asks you to. 
The other three, baby formula, because babies need the nutrients. Uh, in products like Ensure, because they're for your seniors who need the nutrients and a protein bars kind of stuff. Because again, if you're running a race, you need the nutrients and they degrade after a bit of time. That's it. Everything else is the best before. Thank you for bringing that up, Suman. I think it's the bane of all of our existence. <laughs> I can't believe it didn't come up this entire time. <laughs> so I think we have a quick time for about one question. Uh, but if you have other questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we'll be able to answer them following today's uh, event. Uh, so I do have a question here. I'll just throw it out to all of the panelists and whoever wants to, to jump in and add their two cents, that would be fantastic. Uh, so the question is, uh, how can Second Harvest and food rescue nonprofits work to address the root causes of food insecurity, that is poverty and food waste, rather than just providing a Band-Aid temporary solution? Oh, I'll give that one a shot. <laughs> and I know we all have a lot to say to that. Um, huh, we're all working on that to some degree, uh, but it's not an either or. It's always has to be an and. Even though it's a Band-Aid solution, you're not going to take food out of people's mouths because you don't have the right policy. And it's not just up to charities to change policy. It's up to every individual. We are government. So if you see areas where you're not happy, and one of them absolutely is poverty, then you and all of us need to address this. Uh, food loss and waste is another one where Second Harvest is very focused on food loss and waste. We barely stay in our lane, and that's why we've been successful. So we can't work on all of the challenges, but other food rescue organizations are working on poverty reduction policy and working with government to ensure that they do. And I know I'm going to pass it over to Suman because I know he does a lot of that work. But again, I'm gonna go back to it's not an either or. It can't be. As a former low-income single parent, I needed that food. So I'm really delighted people were working on policy, but when people say that to me, it really upsets me because my kids would have eaten if it wasn't for food rescue. Lori, you've hit, you hit it on the head, but like I always use that you cannot fix a wound if you're continuously bleeding. You need to initially stop the bleeding and then look at how to fix the wound or learn how to walk so you don't fall and break your leg again. So I, th I think that is the exact analogy that I will use in this. Uh, you need the band-aids, you need the long-term and you need the systemic. There are three levels of solution you need. Uh, for somebody at home, at the end of the day, every four years, you have three sets of people coming and knocking at your door. And this is something as a person, I did a research quite a few years back on in five different communities across the country where there was really high food insecurity. And we tracked three months before the election to see how many phone calls the MP's office gets regarding food. And it was less than 1%. So if the people are not asking, of course, the politicians are not focusing, simple because the people are signing their paychecks eventually. So if you as people are not really demanding or asking the right questions, it's not going to get done. We will be in the bandit solution and a handful of people like Lori will keep on shouting and talking and asking, but the people generally needs to speak about food insecurity, the poverty, the systemic solutions. I think in Europe, they have, like Switzerland, they're looking at ways to compel, compel the, the industry, the food industry to take matters into their own hands and tackle this, this, you know, record food waste highs that are happening. And I think soon, as everybody turns their eye to sustainability and the climate change conversation, we'll see that it's same with the plastic pollution, Vancouver's straws are gone. Plastic straws, right? It happens. And now we I can't go shopping without my reusable bag. You know, these things happen. I just just the 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 government people in charge compelling it to to make it work, right? With with organizations that that are reducing food waste, right? That is how I I feel. You know, we can't really 
stop people from throwing it out, out but you know when there's money involved when there's you know fines or you know composting fees that are really high they're forced to right it it makes sense it saves money it saves the environment i don't know why we aren't doing it earlier right lori <laughs> right yeah <laughs> yeah but you make a really good point change does happen we don't have the straws here either. A lot of businesses are moving away from plastic bags. So change does happen, but it's a concerted effort by many, not just by a few. We'll join you. That voice has, <laughs> your voice is really strong. <laughs> and that's exactly it. We all need to work in conjunction. conjunction. Things need to move together. We need to be kind of evaluating all possibilities and looking at how we can move forward while also not leaving anyone behind. So we've gone through a lot of great material today, and I hope everyone has learned a lot about the importance of food rescue in supporting the environment, supporting people, feeding people instead of landfills. Uh, if you wanted to learn more about food waste and the importance of food rescue, we would strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to check out our research trilogy. You can head to secondharvest.ca slash, slash research. Uh, some of our titles that Lori had mentioned earlier today are The Avoidable Crisis of Food Waste, The Invisible Food Network, and uh, Wasted Opportunities. So I encourage you to go check those out. Uh, and I do thank everyone so much for taking the last hour to join us. Uh, please stay tuned for more uh, events and, op and opportunities to learn here at Second Harvest. You can always check out our events calendar and uh, keep up to date with us at secondharvest.ca. Thanks so much, folks, and thank you to our wonderful panelists for joining us as well. Hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your days. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Bye.